What's up, everybody? Welcome back to For The Record. Y'all know me. It's your host, Rob Markman. Now we got a special episode today. I know I say that every week, but it's really a special episode because we're discussing the anniversary of a very special piece of work on September 15th, 2009. Kid Cudi dropped his debut album, Man on the Moon, The End of Day. And we're here to talk about it. We're here to break it down on the 10-year anniversary. First up, we have from Genius News, our senior correspondent, my man, Jacques Morel. Man, how you doing? Hey, y'all. This is your first time for the record, first right? First time for the record. I'm glad you finally accepted my invitation, man. First I invite time, you every time. week. Every week. And you never come through. You know, next time. But let's, let's, I'm going to keep doing it. Let's He's not make it the last now. one. Nah, yeah, no doubt. No, <laughs> man. Good to have you. Next up, she is no stranger to the show, my homie, Naomi Zeichner, Artness Partnership Lead at YouTube. What's up, bro? And we're here. What's up? Nice Again, to with be the here. Fi- hoodie season. Yeah. Hoodie season. It's always so cold in here, Rob. Hoodie season. <laughs> and finally, last but certainly not least, he's the co-host of the Grassroots Podcast, one of my favorite podcasts with Aaron Simon. Shout to Aaron. You. But today we got Brandon Hall here with us. What up, brother? Nothing much, man. Thank you for having me. Now, nah, man. So we want to talk Kid Cudi, right, man, on the moon. Um, I kind of want to go back. You know, this album, or Kid Cudi in general, has has been like a people's champion, right? Um. You know, there's maybe bigger albums that you could talk about from that era. You know, the Carter Three mm. coming front of mind, coming out in you know 2008, maybe a year earlier, and and just the the, the commercial juggernaut that that was. Not that Kid Cudi was any slouch, but might not have gotten all the the commercial acclaim. Mm-hmm. But it feels like one of the most impactful albums in the last ten years. Kid Cudi, Man on the Moon. Um, Jacques, where were you when when Man on the Moon dropped? <laughs> oh man, this is crazy. I was uh, about. 21 or 22 um going to say And actually hey we not we not all going to say our age <laughs> yeah, so okay, I'm cool, definitely cool, going to say fair 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 I was going to St. John's University and um I remember you know I was going through some shit at the time like a few months before that my father had passed away and Same. you know I was like not the biggest Cuddy fan after that kid Cuddy but a kid named Cuddy but like I remember listening to this album and then it immediately struck a chord like from the jump like from the time it came out, and I was at DJ Booth at the time, and, and I just remember just like listening to it on repeat, and even now um, listening to these records, I still feel that same like those same chills, those that same energy I felt when I first started playing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Now, though, and we'll get into it about the specifics of the album, but um, you know, hearing about you losing your father, like that that was that was a piece of this album, and, and Cuddy talking about you know yeah. coming of age without his dad, and, and very emotional in that way. So I, I could already see how yeah. how it may have connected. Um, Naomi, um, what do you remember when this album dropped? What do you remember about Man on the Moon? It's so funny because I I was like, this is probably that fall. I had just graduated college. I had just moved to New York. I was just trying to like, I was working like seven days a week. So I wasn't, I you know, I was like not in the blogosphere at that moment. But mm. I remember very much when the when the mixtape dropped the year prior, yeah, and when that the the sort of the Crookers remix dropped, mm. right. And I was a college student at the end of college, like crazy reading blogs every day. You could still download MP3s on blogs, you know, like, um, and just sort of like all of the energy around that remix and around remix culture in general at that time, sort of like uh, moving to New York and mm. for the first time ever, you know, like get going to these like Williamsburg clubs that people were talking about, kind of the mm. scene. It was like cool to wear a, a fitted hat at the time, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, like it, yeah. like not long ago, but also many, many moons ago. So I, I really remember Kid Cudi as that Crookers remix, right? Like right. as sort of like one of those like golden MP3s within the pile you were hoarding on your iPod classic, mm-hmm. right? So um I really, for me, I mean, I think we'll probably talk about this a bunch, but that mixtape was sort of the moment. Um, And I kind of, frankly, like missed a little bit this major label rollout because I was just like not, I was out of uh, of commission. I was, yeah. You're trying to pay that that New York rent. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Brandon, man, um, talk about kind of of where you were, because there's a shift that's happening in hip hop Mm -hmm. around the time of of, of Kid Cudi. You know, I, I know we talk about it. A lot in the light of Fifty Cent versus mm-hmm. Kanye West in two thousand seven with graduation. Got to look but pretty. Cuddy was a part of that kind yeah. of movement yeah. as well. So, what's going on musically that, that you notice right right now? Um, right now, no, right, right, uh, two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. A lot of drug use. Yeah. A lot of hidden. Uh, a lot of different drug use too. It was yeah, a lot of like think, drugs that hip hop wasn't used to either talking about yeah, or experimenting. Yeah, I think I think Cuddy is one of those people where like 
when his project first came out, like he talked a lot about drugs. He didn't get scrutinized for it, whereas you have these newer rappers now mm-hmm. that get killed for it, right? I think, but that whole project was one of those times where there was a transitional phase in music where things started to get a little pretty. No one liked the tough guy anymore, like mm-hmm. the Fifty Cents of the world. You know what the I mean? No, no one liked that. No people liked the flashy people. People liked people that were emotional and revealed themselves to be a little bit more transparent emotionally. Where I think it allowed a lot of fans and, and viewers to connect with them. Whereas a lot of other artists, they struggled. I think he was one of the people that kind of to. Or I'll say, yeah, he ushered in that that wave of just being free, like saying, "Hey, I have problems. Hey, I'm yeah. I'm going through things. Hey, I, I have a drug problem, but fuck it, I'm here." Like, right. so yeah. It, it was interesting though, because it, like it, he wasn't saying that on Twitter yet or on Tumblr, yeah. Yeah. right? So yeah. it was this really unique era where people were starting to talk about these things, but it was really music was the forum to talk about it, mm-hmm. not necessarily like your merch or your pop up yeah. shop yeah. or your Twitter feed, right? So it was kind of this yeah. like really specific, weird in between time that I think is really important, and yeah. so, you know. Definitely. Yeah, no, yeah, it's dope. And, and and blogs like um, you know, the ones I was going to, the two dope boys of the world, the Nat mm-hmm. Rights, the Miss Infos, the you heard that new exclusive yeah, zone. Exclusive, the exclusive zone. zone and yeah. all of that. Like you would go to hear these new records from artists that the mainstream wasn't quite on yet. Yeah. And then when he was right, we didn't have Twitter to vent. Like that was kind of the 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 sounding stage for a lot of the problems. You know, it's funny what what Brandon talks about because I I, I do want to make the distinction. I, I think Cuddy does usher in an emotional era with this project and the kid named Cuddy that came before it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's always been a part of hip hop, right? When you go to, I always say this, you got to give the credit, like Scarface yeah. mm-hmm. is talking about mental health. Um, yeah. You know, um, Joe Budden, mm-hmm. you know, was very emotional with his records. Though he may have rapped in a more aggressive tone, like like I think the tone shift, the, the tone shift again. Even Joe, a lot of the, the projects that that he put out, we worked on. He he was angry, but those yeah. are real emotions. Like a right. lot of times, you would never know, and that's what I I, I think that's why I kind of connected with Cuddy's because you know here you are, I'm working with Joe, and and he's doing all these amazing things, we're making music, but he was hurting, and I never really knew until we laid the record. You know right, what I mean? Right. Same thing with Cuddy. I feel like once Cuddy, once that album for me, Minimum, once it came out, it was like, wow, like I was touring at the time. I was still paying for college, using tour money to yeah. do that. And I'm just like, damn, he's going through it too. Like it's not just, you know what I mean? Like there are people in the world that you can still kind of connect to in this crazy entertainment business. And mm-hmm. I think that that's one of the things where it was easier. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because Joe's music was amazing, but there's times where we still joke about it to this day. It's like, yo, if you're listening to a Joe song, it's like, yo, are you okay? Like, you know what I mean? Like, are you doing all right? Like, even now, he'll play something. I'm like, you're all right. And he'll be like, I'm fine, Brandon. But it's like crazy. <laughs> but but yeah, it opens up for the Drakes, the Cuddies yeah, of the world. Yeah, all of those people I, can kind of kind of though. If I'm being honest, when I hear my friends are listening to Cuddy songs, I'm kind of like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, same. But that's, that's my point. Right. It's, it's a cooler. It's a cooler. Uh, uh, music, I guess that it's it's almost hidden. Like these are mm. hidden emotions. Like mm. even I know we're gonna get into it, but right. the, the the second record off of Man in the Moon is very very telling to me. It's yeah. very telling wh- where he is. And now in retrospect, listening to it, it's like damn. Like, let's go into it. Sound, soundtrack to my life. You had a point you wanted. I just to make? want to say that like you were right because like it has been in, in hip hop for since like Scarface and even like Biggie talking about right. like you know um, suicidal, suicidal thoughts, thoughts yeah. the message yeah. don't yeah. push me because I'm close to the edge. Yeah. That's mental health. You know, yeah. like. But I think that it was one of the first times that, like, cause this, none of this happens without 808s and Heartbreak, which mm. we're going to get into and how Cuddy is very much influential. Mm-hmm. But, like, it it was the first time that it was a whole record of someone else going through something was a major hip-hop hit yeah. and a major mainstream hit. Like, it was, that's, that record sold so many records. Right. And, like, all these other, other things that came out of it, like, So Far Gone, like, mm. all of 808's children... Mm. Right is effectively what allowed this to be possible. But I I, I, I kind of go. I hear what you're saying. And I think yeah. you're right. But I, you know, I give Cuddy more credit for 808s. Oh yes, maybe than most people. Yes. You know, a lot of Kanye albums come, and when you hear it and you look back, you can kind of tell who he, he was around. So <laughs> the first the two or three was like Consequence, Heavy. Like you know, I hear Yeezus, I hear Travis Scott, I hear Drake. I hear 808, I hear Cuddy, but Drake wasn't around. Yeah, I know, but like, 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 I, I, like hear, I hear a lot of Drake. A, a lot of those records could have been Cuddy records. I, you know, I think Cuddy influenced 808. Mm-hmm. You so know, he had four co- he had four writing credits right. on it, and yeah. I'm sure he didn't get all the writing credits that he could have got. And he probably did. <laughs> to, Con- to Kanye's credit, uh-huh. as much as he uses collaborators, okay, like Kanye will credit. 
50 people on the song. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you just brought him Fair. coffee at the right yeah, time and that one yeah. sip led to the to the first <laughs> line, yeah, he's, he's giving you're getting you. credit. You're getting a residual. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. To Kanye's credit. But I, I give Cuddy way more credit for yeah. 808s than, than, you know, I think maybe most people, even though Kanye's name was on the front, I think he, he was heavily involved with that. I think, um, I think that's one of the things that kind of led to... Kid Cudi's like almost depression, right? You know what I mean. Like I think when he was working on that project, you could see kind of a shift in music, and I think a small part of him looked at it like, "Damn, well, I was kind of taking this 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 body of work or this new sound and ushering it in, and now you guys are doing it, and now it's like, well, how does where do I fit in with that? Right. Well, well you know, it goes back to what I said earlier. There was a lot of people getting more of the the commercial acclaim, like Drake. Yeah. Is way more, you know. I think when we talk about emotions and rap, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Drake is at the forefront of that, and mm-hmm. and we give Drake a lot of credit, and Drake does deserve a lot of credit. Yeah, but you know, I think you t- tend to forget when it's not anniversary time, or if you're not a Cuddy super fan, it's like, yo, Cuddy was at the nucleus of that movement. Um, day and night, yep. Th- there was the 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 report. I think Cuddy had said himself that Drake wanted to kind of be on the remix, but Cuddy wanted to keep it more for himself. He he had. And maybe this goes to the album, like, I think he had a clear idea of who he was, or at least a clear idea that he wanted to work out who he was as a musician first Mm -hmm. before letting everybody in. Because I think, especially in that blog era, it was ripe for collaboration. So it was very easy to to let Drake jump on something or let... While they jump on something, or you know, what I'm saying that they all have relationships. We have to acknowledge the Jim Jones Day and Night remix right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah listen, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm gonna tell you something, yeah. and, I, and I know, yeah, I've I, heard that so long. I know <laughs> that that I feel like when that came out, Cuddy was was kind of against it. Like mm. he, he, there, there was a because Hot was playing that, not his version. Well, that, but yeah, that I, was... I think the way that New York works, I think that Jim Jones remix was very instrumental for Cuddy to reach. Uh, audience that wasn't online. That's Absolutely. the Trojan horse. Now that mm-hmm. gives the DJs yeah. who are on Hot 97 and quite frankly can't take a chance on something with a Jim Jones verse, it's like, okay, now I can kind of take a chance on this record. Mix the original yeah. in at right. the same time. Yeah, but to your point, like Jim, that J- at that point, Jim is hot. In, in the city, yeah. and he's on a hot record. Like, Ballin. yeah, like he's <laughs> yeah. hot. At Jim, this Jim point. was the hottest rapper in New York. He's I would hot. die on he's that. He's hot. Hill. Like, if, at if, that if time. I'm yeah. hot or any place else, yeah, I think I'm gonna go with the Jim right. Jones record, regardless of that. It's the same thing with with Jacques and, and LMA. I, I right. see why mm-hmm. that there's that uh, that power struggle for the record in, in place. And that's and I mean, and that's to Kanye's credit, right? Is like Hot wasn't able to take that risk, right? But Kanye was at yeah. the attendee, you know, release party for this mixtape Fighting. or whatever, understanding mm-hmm. that like. Uh, taking a risk or sort of acknowledge, like pulling things from the ground up is one of the sort of keys to longevity, right? And I think we still see that model so much with Drake or even with J Balvin or whoever, Mm -hmm. right? I think it's, but it it was very ripe in that era, but it hasn't grown old. Yeah. I think Cuddy has, from from the jump, has like had, has known very much that what his sound was and has wanted to kind of carve that out because like even like looking through old interviews of his while working on the piece that we're, uh, I'm doing, like he's very much, this, he's what he says all the time. He's like, it's very much important to establish your own sound before anybody has a chance to kind of kind of co-opt it right. in a mm-hmm. way. Right. And like in his latest interview that he said, I, I could have put Kanye in all my records, but I didn't want Kanye to essentially like define him. Yep. Yeah. You know? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. Uh, my uh, Man on the Moon to me is a classic. Yeah. I think it's a great album. I hate to start with, with I, what I don't like. I always yeah. like to leave with what I like. But actually, the record that Kanye produced... I, Sky... I, uh, Sky uh, um, no, Make Him Say. Make Him Say. And Kanye has a production credit on that. I hate that. That's the one record to me that I'm like, yeah. does not fit on this album. It was weird to me. I think every other kind of record is great and has its place. And Make Him Say is just like... What is this? I have to justify it, it too. Didn't age yeah. super well, sort of uh, topically. It feels like. I also know. hate that. Me personally, d- disclaimer: I hate when dudes make songs exclusively about getting head. Like I don't need a yeah. whole song. Yeah. About, like, yeah, we all been there, my guy. <laughs> I do. I need a whole song for like weird about flex, but okay. That song or like other songs from the mixtape era. Like there's a song called Maui Wowie from the mixtape. I like Maui Wowie. Wow. Wow. I do. I, 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 I do wow. like. That's what, that's, that's what I, I don't. Favorite. I don't want to. Get spicy. Get spicy. I don't want to defend Make Say per se, but I do want to defend like innocent Cuddy and sort of non emo Cuddy. Like there was. These were kids who were like having so much fun in New York City, right? And that was so much part of 
the aspirational, like being able to project onto, there was still some mystery. He wasn't on social. Right. So you were able to sort of project your life onto him. And, and there was like this exciting innocence about the Sonics as well. And, yeah. what, you know, whatever you want to say about it, it Make Say is a fun record. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of think that Kid Cudi as a fun artist is a little bit, right, like not yeah. been as essential in his legend as maybe it should be. Right. Like I think yeah. it, was, it was a good thing about him. Let, let's talk, you, did you want to get into uh, Soundtrack to My Life? I, we can. Yeah, yeah, we let's can. get let's get into it, man. I mean, for me, I, I think this was the the perfect record that described where he was when he created that record and where he is now. Like yeah. after hearing Kid See Ghost, it's like, damn, like you this was he's one of the rare artists for me that I that's why I think I connected to him. Not from because lyrically, not because of his style, but because for at least for me, I believe him to be genuine, right? right. Like yeah. the music that he put out. Like and and seeing where he is now, it's like, damn, you were really going through some real shit, and you wore it on your sleeve musically. I love artists like that. You'll always get my buy-in when I know that you're authentic. So for me, the coming off the intro and then hearing that first record, I literally got chills. Like even now, when I think mm -hmm. about the record, Ooh. I'm like, oh my god! Like it's one of my favorite records, and I'm not the biggest. Uh, right. Cuddy fan, I'll, I'll say that. But this project and that record for me, it's one of my favorite records just because I know it's real. You know what I mean? I can feel it. Like even when he's laying certain parts of that record, yeah, you could hear, yeah, you yeah. could hear it in his voice where he's struggling. And it, yeah. it's just one of the more powerful records that I don't think really gets enough credit to what it should. Uh, and I think that I think it's dope that now. Even doing this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it, it could at least get some sort of For some sure. sort of shot. Was there anything on the album that that, that connected to you personally? Like, I mean, honestly, soundtrack to my life, um, a Heart of a Lion, <sighs> My mm. World, um, Cuddy Zone. Yeah. Right, right. You know, like solo I mean, dolo. like if you think about what like solo dolo, especially, but like as to Cuddy Zone, like Cuddy Zone comes in the middle of like the fourth chapter, yeah. stuck, yeah. and it's like meant to kind of show like what. Like uh, 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 what, like happiness or what security could right. feel like, and that song really conveys that. Like mm -hmm. every time, I remember every time I would listen to me, my friends would just like kind of just close their eyes and just kind of zone to it. It's like because you just really felt like, okay, I feel fine, everything's cool. Right. You know, you just went through a whole album of him like laying down what the hell's bothering him, and then now like you listen to Cuddy Zone, you just really feel like it's chill, everything's gonna yeah. be okay. I, I think one of the things he did on this album for the first time, like because just growing up in New York, I was a kid, I was outside. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I was on the block and we seen the good and the bad, but at the same time I was in the comic book store. Mm -hmm. So there was that nerd factor. Wow. And me personally, I felt I can express both. I didn't have to like hide it. Um, but like my world, but you knew kids who were kind of just like maybe not as confident. So even on my world where he's like entertain myself, laughed at myself, as I grew to be a teen, I disguised myself, had mm -hmm. low self-esteem, especially with the girls, tried every sport just to impress all the girls. Like I knew kids like that and and I, you know, for the first time, I think hip hop was speaking to to, to those kids, maybe who yeah. weren't outside or or didn't have the confidence to kind of be who they were, mm -hmm. and maybe had to wear a mask. And 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 I give them credit for that. And I I think that's why if you're a Kid Cudi fan once, I think you're a Kid Cudi fan forever. I think that fandom Definitely. doesn't. You always welcome yeah. back. It's like yeah. Kanye wore the backpack on stage and like kind of kick creaked the door open, and then Cudi came in and just like like. It blew it down, right? Yeah. You know, like it wasn't about being like, like I said, being like this bravado. We're right. talking about, but even Kanye. Kanye, even in all the change that he did, Kanye never lacked confidence. That's the yeah, one thing fair. Kanye yeah. never lacked. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Like, fair, you know what I'm saying? Like he and he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna come in this backpack." You saw me rhyming mm -hmm. in yeah. Fat Beats, yeah. But the yeah. backpack is Louis. Yeah, yeah. fucking your questions. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but even Kanye, <laughs> Kanye is is well documented in saying things like, "Yo, Cuddy is someone that helped make me." Like uh, he, yeah. he he he's one of the people that helped to uh, cultivate my sound. Like you gotta, there. Cuddy is really responsible for. I remember even now thinking about it. Uh, it was a DJ Booth article that I think uh, Yo wrote. Yo wrote, Yo yeah, wrote it. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I back think, when Cuddy was like going off. Yes, on yes. Twitter. You remember the story, the Travis yeah, Scott right. story? Um, could you go on. <laughs> so long story short, Travis Scott was a big, big hip hop fan. Oh, that, and, and, yes, and yes. He, like there are a few other people out there like that that look up to Cuddy like that. Logical like you got people, Yachty. yeah. Like there's a lot of people Jayden. that yeah. the list could go on. There's a lot of people that really got a sound from Cuddy, and even still to this day, you can hear the Cuddy influence on on certain and records. I have a hypothesis that kids that age, like Yachty's age, mm -hmm. and and not just artists, right? Like that maybe. 
this album or albums from this era were some of the like first and last that they ever 100%. bought on a CD, yeah. right? Like in 2009, the Virgin Megastore was still open in New York City, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and maybe some of the first artists that they really like loved without all of the branding surrounding yeah. it, right? Like without the social, that that mm-hmm. connection felt like purer and realer mm-hmm. and deeper. Like, I don't know if this is true, but I do think that he has like, you know, there is such a deep bond between his fans and him that I think is unique and like a little bit mysterious even and, to me. And and even further, maybe if you could speak on it, because I, I would love to speak on it. Not only the fan, but it, we're, we're at the place where his fandom are growing up to be artists. Like I, I yep. fully mm-hmm. believe that Jaden Smith now you know, grew up a Cuddy fan. 100%. And, and it's the reason why Rocky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, even Ooh. Uzi, even, Uzi. E- even when I hear, you know, push me to the edge, all my friends are dead. Mm-hmm. Like I think Cuddy kicks down the door for you to be able to say that in that way on one of the biggest singles of, of the past yeah. three years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially when Uzi's is putting out so many records and this is just like one of those that pops, right? And it's like, this is how Uzi always raps. Yeah. Right. right. Like he always talks But, but he also stuff. too, the, the, the funny thing, right, is, is you know, because because Cuddy, you know, the, the Lonely Stoner, right, yeah. was, was kind of his thing. Even with Uzi, whenever we see um, video of Uzi just roaming around Manhattan, mm-hmm. <laughs> he looks so sad. But it's by himself. It, yeah. It's like uh, there might be a security guard off to the yeah. back or something because Uzi is five, five two. Five, shout it, the it, Lord. It, short <laughs> I, I saw him in the airport and he was literally by himself, just walking. Right. Like it was the weirdest thing because you would never expect someone of his magnitude to just be solo. You know what I'm saying? At least not have like a bodyguard or something. Right, right. He was just literally eating a cake. Just he looked like a kid just walking through the airport. <laughs> yeah. and I'm just like. Oh, okay. It's it's you. All right. That, that that's cool. Whatever. Right. <laughs> what 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 do we say about the? You know, I want to touch too on the production of this mm-hmm. album because I, I want to shout out because you know I think a lot of it gets credited to Kanye, but Kanye had very minimal this production credits on this album. And um, Emil Haney, yeah. yeah, um, huge part of this album. Dot the Genius, obviously, um, with Day and Night. Um, and my man Plain Pat. Mm-hmm. You know, the first time I heard it's funny because I heard Day and Night in two thousand seven. I was at a listening, was it 2007? I was at a listening for a Consequence album. Maybe it was Don't Quit Your Day Job. So we were all kind of hanging out. And then, yeah, so it was before graduation that drops and playing Pat says, hey, man, um, I got graduation in the car. You want to hear graduation? You want to drive around listening listen to graduation? I'm like, hell yeah. So we're driving around listening to graduation. So he has me in the car already. And, and then he, while I have you here, Here's an artist that I'm working with. <laughs> <laughs> happens all the time. But he played day and night, and the record was amazing. On first listen, yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just so dope. How I forgot what my point is, but it was just so dope. <laughs> how it was like this local thing. That's though. how like, dope the record is. This was a kid who worked in the Bape store. Yeah, it, it felt like very local, and the production of it. That's what it was. The production of it stood out. Um, it's got a club slash. Therapeutic feel. Does that make sense? Like it's like a calm storm. Like it's like it's almost like like you want to scream inside, yeah. but it's just like you're chill outside. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? That I know that probably doesn't. It's make headphone sense, music. But. Yeah, like yeah. it's it's just chill music, and I yeah. think that even produ- even production wise, like if you remove the lyrics from that album, you could listen to that album just production oh, wise. Right. You could 100 percent listen to it. Like I can hear that in a club. Just by itself, just playing. So I think that's also the, what took that body of work to the next level is that he was able to ride on these records the way that he did with the content that he did, and then the musical ability just took itself. Well, to well it's level. definitely like moody music, and and yeah, and, and, yeah. And, uh, shout to Joe Mood music. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we take for granted today too. Like we all live in this cross genre world. We're all used to that. We've all been listening right. to everything, but like I don't think you know to have like Ratatat produce one of the biggest yeah, songs yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like that wasn't. I, around that time, we were like, uh, that was still new. That like right. an '80s party and an indie party and a hip hop party could actually just be one party or whatever. Right. You know, but that, like, that's what like downtown was like, and you know, because you were in New York, so that's yeah. exactly what downtown was like. So mm-hmm. just knowing him being in New York at the time, like it was totally a reflection of what was going on. I don't know that anybody had captured it no. quite the way he did. I mean, Sonic maybe or. like MGMT or Vampire right. Weekend. Like yeah. I feel like Vampire Weekend are like that's who I think of as contemporaries to this album. Right. Almost. He also pulled like his Sonic Scape. From like the tattoo in his finger, his hands, like Pink Floyd mm-hmm. and like Electric Light Orchestra, like you know, like when I was like writing the script to this video, like that's what I was listening to, right. and I really felt that. I really 
see what he was going with that because those records, you know, they sat, they had so many different sounds, so many different, it was like so the, the scope of like of like animals, right? A pink Floyd's mm-hmm. animals, right? You hear like the the hot the 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 the, the, the pig, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's like just knowing that Cuddy was like thinking of this mindscape of like, okay, I need to make this as vast as possible. I need to reach as many people as possible because yeah. I have a message to give them. Right. And how can I do that by incorporating every single genre I possibly well, can? Well, they also they had a budget, right? That too. Yeah. I think you know it was <laughs> over a year. It was yeah, over yeah. a year between the mixtape and the eventual rollout of this album, and like. Like you could tell that they were like, oh shit, like we got a budget, like let's get common, let's right. get strings. Yeah. Yeah. Like they right. went for it and you can you could feel it. And it I, I don't, you know, it doesn't feel like a negative, but you can right. definitely hear it. It feels like a different time. You, you know, the, the other thing about the sure. time is 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 and I often um miss the days of me personally when lyricism was was the chief thing that yeah. we looked at, right? But, you know, I think Cuddy would, because, you know, I want to shout out Yo again, because he wrote in the piece, and Cuddy has said himself, like, Cuddy's never been the best rapper. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that was ever his mission. And out of his own mouth, he didn't care about necessarily being the best rapper. He just wanted to make music that you connect to. And we overlooked, all, I, I think at a time in, in, in 2009, when we were still kind of, you know, Lil Wayne is still the biggest rapper. So it's mm-hmm. all about what you say and, and how you say it and, and how you flip that metaphor and Cuddy, like we didn't mind it, like because it just felt different. We did mind it though at the time, because he was like, I remember there was this Hip Hop DX interview where the interviewer had read a question to him, like about a comment of someone hating on his rhymes, and Cuddy's like, now you got to read some comment that I don't like. It's like basically saying I don't give a fuck about right. what you did. But people really did give him shit for his rhymes, like, mm-hmm. right. and I feel like. Maybe you can all, maybe you could, it's a fair argument to say that like he's one of the people that kind of brought us to this era where it's now it's like, okay, you know, lyricism is, is, is conveyed through brevity. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're able to say what in four words, what would uh, Eminem would say in 20 words 20 years ago. And then just with a, yeah. You know, yeah, but like at the, end of it, I get at it. the time, <laughs> at the time, like it was still a thing, you know, because Currency and Wiz Khalifa, other people on that freshman list were still. Laying down bars, you know, mm-hmm. crooked one, you know, before that, like Joel, they were still laying down bars. I don't, but even those guys, like they never looked like, at him as lyricist. like a lyricist. You know right. what I'm saying? Like you, you look at Cuddy as an artist, and even mm-hmm. if you're understanding the the body of work, you're really looking at this as almost like his outlet, his his therapeutic session with himself. Yeah. But he's just sharing it in with the fans. I don't really think. You, you look at him in that light. I think if he really applied himself, given the type of music that he makes, could he probably be way better in, in uh, a way better lyricist? Of course he would, at least in my opinion. But I don't think that, t- to your point, I don't think that that's his goal. His goal is kind of just to express himself. And, you know, in the midst of that, his tribe coming back of him and they understand him. They, he understands them and then they just run together. So I don't, and, I don't and know. It's, and it's not to say that it's devoid of lyrics because I, I think it's just the mode of what you choose to deliver yeah. the message. So yeah. it wasn't through these complex metaphors. But, you know, on Soundtrack to My Life, when he's just like a happy ending will be slitting my throat. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck, that shit hits you. Like that yeah. that wakes like yeah. that lyric catches you on the yeah. first time. Like, wait, hold up, what? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's just a different method of of, of, of songwriting than it's, maybe hip hop was it's used to. Like at the time. shock. It's almost like shock therapy, therapy through lyrics. Right. What he does, yeah. like, there's rare moments in this body of work, or just him in general, where you'll be in a really, really good zone. Almost like it's like, oh, it's like you're coming out of a deep place, <laughs> and then he'll say something crazy. It's like, fuck, yeah, right. yeah. I'm right back, but the yeah. beat is still good, and you still roll with it. It's almost like he hypnotizes you with these depressing things laid over really intricate melodies. That and is the it's best genius. way to put it. That it's is genius. The best way to put it. Like, yeah, it's genius. Right. I, I want to go no to- pun. <laughs> pun. <laughs> Fuck it. Bar. That's a bar. I want to go to this Travis Scott quote, because again, we just talked about the influence, right? Mm. Um, he told MTV in 2015, I feel like he's a part of my story of how I became who I am. There would be no Travis Scott if it wasn't for him. Yeah. Um, talking about Kid Cudi. Of course, um, and we we see that that influence, right? Hundred percent. Not- that's that. If if especially if you know music, you can you can see it. Mm-hmm. Even if even if Travis never goes on record and says what he says, and they they have this whole big car ride in the backseat and he's crying and all this other yeah, crazy shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even if that never happens, you can hear the influence. The way he lays ad libs, the way he does his two tracks, you can hear a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Even the way he structures um, his, his melodies on top of melodies, you can hear it. Like it's it, and that's the thing why. 
cut, uh, Cuddy will forever be cemented because I think that sound, it's very, very distinct when you hear it. And if you know it, you'll, you'll, you'll know what it is. And beyond Sonics, right? Like, I think what's so amazing about Cuddy is just like it was so aspirational, right? Yeah, like yeah. that every lyric didn't need to be perfect mm -hmm. in order to convey authenticity, that he had cool friends, that there was style, but he didn't, it didn't all need to be fleshed out. There could yeah. still be some mystery. And that like, also that he had other revenue streams, like he was an actor too, mm -hmm. you know, like he was sort of really yeah. living a life that I think a lot of people who stayed inside um, were excited about aspiring to. And I think that, you know, are still kind of like a, a, a career like Travis's, you could say, is sort of modeled um, based on on being able to dream yeah. what he could see in uh, Cuddy. R.I.P. to How to Make it in America. Word. <laughs> oh. People really, I feel like the fans of that show really love that show. Really yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't that into it. Yeah. I watched yeah. that show. I like that show. I, I remember because I was at Double <laughs> <laughs> I, Except the, the yeah. Rasta Monster. Outside part, of that, I was just outside like, that, that, that got a little weird. Oh. But in New York, like that. It felt like New it York. It felt like New York. Like I remember when I was a kid, like, it, you know, trying to make it in music and, and doing all these yeah. things. You, and you're, you know, I, I I fuck with that shit. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. Like that's the grind, and that's <laughs> why I connected with that show. They went from like a couple prints to like Bloomingdale. Like, yeah, you know, I was right. like, come on, <laughs> yo, man. I was like, they need at least like two, like even like what, like they would try to be Entourage. Like, right. even, like there was like it two could, or three seasons. It could happen. Got his big it can happen, break. man. But yeah, you know, it's fair. Fair. <laughs> it can you happen. Know, it, 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 it can, can happen. happen. Yeah. I've seen people that you would never even think turn into mega stars. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I remember when I first met Drake, and he he was a kid with a jean jacket. On bad shape up and was the biggest oh. Joe fan. Dead serious. I'm Drake. And and and, and, and uh, so serious though. But people thought he was so whack. And now look at him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it happen. Obviously not within a year's time. Right. But it took for that one mixtape right. so far gone to just take you right. somewhere different. But I know. I digress. Um, well, let's talk about. That. I just want to talk about maybe personal highlights of the album. Like what you know. Ten years later. We're talking about this album still. I think it affected people in, in such deep ways. So I just go around the room. Just um, Jacques, I'll start with you, man. Personal highlight. Uh, still soundtrack to my life yeah. forever, yeah. forever and ever and ever soundtrack to my life. Um, uh, solo dolo, the end of it. He's like when he's like, when will I learn from the words in my songs? I'm Mrs. Mm -hmm. Solo dolo. Mm -hmm. um, that one. Um, Heart of a Lion. I'm just going yeah. straight through it and um, Cuddy Zone, right. yeah, like and yeah. and up up in a way because mm -hmm. like for, so up up in a way is supposed to be his wake up wake yeah, and bake yeah. track, yeah. but like you know up up in a way I feel like is very much reminiscent of, not reminiscent but very much of like Cuddy's like post rehab time mm -hmm. because I don't know if you if you look at Cuddy's lyrics since like he came out of rehab he's just been so happy yeah. and all of his interviews and he's just been so happy so positive and i feel like he's in his up up in a way right now he's mm -hmm. very much in his cuddy zone he has a daughter like he's so like those are like the songs because i feel like they really track the story of like cuddy you know he told the soundtrack to his life he told you how his music was therapy and how he's starting to listen to it himself and then now he's up up in a way he's much happier and he's in a much better place mm -hmm. I think Pursuit of Happiness is like the one for a reason. You know, it's basic to say maybe, but I think like uh, that song's just had a really beautiful life and it's still a highlight of the set and obviously like lived on through the School by Q Lana Del Rey song. Like yeah. I, I think that song deserves the the credit yeah. it already has. And it's such a great way to, to round out towards the end of the album what that is just a great exclamation point. Yeah. Uh, solo Dolo for me and even Pursuit of Happiness, but Solo Dolo just because I like the arrangement. I like how that record was set up and I like mm -hmm. how it ends. The ending for me is like, I put that shit on, on dump. Yeah, <laughs> and no, it, like no, the no. ending for me of that record is like, ah, it, it gets you every time. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like it's yeah. one of those dope ass records like, yeah. It, it never gets bad. So but the yeah. ending of Pursuit of Happiness too is the why did I drink so much? It's well, so well, that's much. the one thing. To, ah. I, I feel like that's the cliche record. But yeah. for me, I, anytime that record came on, I was like, all right, this is my shit. Like, you know what I'm it's saying? A, like yeah, such a record comes on. It's, it's such just a like, reflection of what was going on at that time. Like you know, that's that's being able to get into your first club in New York yeah. City. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and being on a scene, I don't know if we wild was party. We was probably one oak. Definitely in one oak. I, yeah. I can tell you where I first heard that record, and I think it's either one oak or it was, uh, it was Greenhouse. Like, Greenhouse. Greenhouse. That's Greenhouse. what it is. <laughs> I'll never God. forget that yeah, shit. Right. That record came on? Yeah. Oh, my God. And you're already drunk by the time it came yeah. on. <laughs> it was a dub. Full sparkles with my bottles. Please. Yeah. For me, I, I always remember. Sky Might Fall might be like my yeah. personal favorite because it's just like this... I think again, growing up in a kid in Brooklyn where everything yeah. and anything will happen and can go wrong, and still having that fuck it attitude. I, mm. I'm not worried. Like, it'll work mm. itself out. 
was dope. And I remember one thing about that, and I always wondered if it was a troll that Cuddy did, but I don't know if you guys remember. In the blog era, um, there was a mo- Transformers 2 was coming out. Yeah. So it was Transformers mm-hmm. 2 trailer, and the trailer dropped with Sky Might Fall intertwined in the trailer. So everybody was like, holy shit, Cuddy. It's Again, crazy. like this is like the people's chant, right? So He got he, synced, a big sync. Yeah, getting yeah. a big sync is like, it feels yeah. like it's all of our wins. Mm. But then it was like a weird Vimeo link. Turned out it was fake. Uh, <laughs> but all the blogs oh, posted man. it. I just I always remember this. this. I and I was like, oh shit, he's in the Transformers movie. That's crazy. But it, it it definitely like it got him a lot of blog posts for I'm a week. Like, why are I don't we giving bloggers a bad reputation right now for huh? unverified posts? I'm Yo, like, now that, that's that's expert marketing. Nah, that's amazing. Now, now that's, a, you, that's a great <laughs> troll. Now, when you think about it, though, you can you may be able to cut it, uh, credit Cuddy for clickbait. Yeah, if, if if his team did that, that was excellent. That's what I'm saying. Guerrilla marketing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I never saw it, but it sounds. Right. Dope. No, I, I, I remember having exactly what you're PTSD about. about unverified Kanye trailers <laughs> and making sure people didn't post. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. But thank y'all for for for, for joining me, man. I, I love kind of these discussions because this is our culture. This is our music. This is important. Um, you know, obviously, ten years is, is a long time, but it's not that long. But it. As long as we continue to talk about these works like this, we just want to ensure that they'll live forever. So through this conversation, definitely, yeah, definitely, I definitely. feel that, and definitely we want to hear from you. We know you're all Cuddy fans out there. Go to the comments, tell us your favorite Cuddy songs off of Man on the Moon, your favorite Cuddy moments. Y'all see me in the comments every week. It's really me. Y'all know I talk back, man. So come fuck with us, man, and check us out next week. This for the record. Peace.